The League of Legends community has always done this really fun thing that I've always loved, which is periodically, every once in a while, players will create time capsules. These time capsules take the form of Reddit posts over on the League of Legends subreddit, where users will create lists detailing everything from how many champions are in the game to various bits of news that everyone is currently discussing. Normally, these posts are a bit of fun for whoever makes them, where the community can have a bit of self-reflection, taking stock of where the state of the game currently is, is. But now that League has been around for a while, these posts have actually turned into genuinely interesting time capsules. The earliest known time capsule I'm aware of took place in April of 2013, which was a special post for two specific reasons. Namely, this post was special because it was the first time capsule created, so credit for the idea, I suppose, should go to this Reddit user. But this time capsule was special because it also included another Redditor's post. A different user created a predictive front page of what they thought the League of Legends subreddit would look like in the distant future of 2023. Seeing as we are now living in that distant future, I thought this might be a good opportunity to take a look at what the state of League of Legends was back then and what people thought it would look like today. We're going to take a look at both of these posts and see everything that they have to offer, but we're going to start off with the original time capsule, which begins by stating, Today's date is the 14th of April, 2013, and it begins by listing the champions. There are currently 112 champions in the game, Zac being the newest. The champion with the highest win rate in solo queue is Rumble at 55%. The champion with the highest pick rate is Caitlyn at 43%. And then there's an interesting note, there are currently no black champions. I remember this was a interesting joke that a lot of people just started to make after a series of champion releases, but the joke would be retired a few months after this post with the release of Lucian. You know, we really have come a long way in terms of champions. Today we have 164 compared to the 112 back then, and Zac being the newest champion with Rumble being potentially the strongest feels odd. I mean, these were two champions who were considered to have innovative, complicated kits, maybe kits that were even a little bit too strong back then, which are completely simple <laughs> compared to today's standards. Next up, we have skins, which reads that Corky and Shogath are tied for the most legendary skins with two each. Annie and Rise are tied for the most skins with nine, and there is only one ultimate skin, Pulsefire Ezreal. Oh, that takes me back. I remember when Pulsefire Ezreal was a big deal that everyone was freaking out about, but of course Riot has completely run away with their skin game today, I guess. Currently, Lux and Misfortune are tied for having the most skins with 19 each, and Ezreal, Caitlyn, and Ari all have 17 skins apiece. We should also probably mention that ultimate skins aren't even considered the most rare or impressive skins anymore. There's entire new categories of skins like Mythic and Legendary and Legacy and Hextech. I mean, there is <laughs> there's quite a bit more in the game now. The post continues on to discuss some details and features of of League of Legends in general. Firstly, there are currently four maps available, Proving Grounds, Summoner's Rift, Crystal Scar, and Twisted Tree Line, with the Howling Abyss soon to be released. There are three game modes as of writing, with 5v5, 3v3, and Dominion. It's fast, it's fun. The current standard meta is Solo Top, with Jungler, Solo Mid, AD carry and support bot lane, and features to be added soon, replay system, ARAM rerolls, ARAM Q, and also the client still uses Adobe Air. I love this part of the post because this really goes to show the state of mind that players had back then in early 2013. People assumed that League of Legends was just gonna continue having new game modes added to it, new maps that were added, but Today, there are fewer maps and game modes than there were back then. Back then, people assumed that the game was just gonna continue to grow and expand into a larger and larger experience with more and more content, but Riot said that nobody really played Dominion or 3v3, which is why they ended up getting removed from the game. It's also funny to see them note that the current standard meta is a solo top, a jungler, solo mid, and AD carry and support bot lane. That is something that is entirely the meta today and probably will be for the rest of time, but people thought that might change. I'm pleased to report that here in 2023, we finally have the replay system added, as well as ARAM rerolls and ARAM queue. I guess back then was when you still had to go into custom games to play ARAM at all. And it is funny to see them note that the client still uses Adobe Air. 
I think by now the leak client has been overhauled and reworked at least two times, and there has never been a moment in history when people have been happy with it. <laughs> Next up, we have the competitive scene, which talks a little bit about the current teams in LCS in North America. There's Curse, Dignitas, TSM, Snapdragon, Counterlogic Gaming, Good Game University, Vulcan, Team Marn, and Complexity. In Europe, we have Gambit Gaming, Fnatic, SK Gaming, Evil Geniuses, Copenhagen Wolves, Against All Authority, Giants, and Dragonborns. World Elite is currently, statistically, the strongest team in the world. I'm guessing that's because WE just won IPL5. Oh, but looking at this list of rosters is almost depressing to me. I mean, I remember all these teams and I remember rooting for them, but so few of them even exist anymore. The only teams that are still in North America are Curse, which is now Team Liquid, and then Dignitas and TSM Snapdragon, although TSM is going to be leaving the LCS. Every other one of the North American teams have completely folded as organizations, or at least they don't have League of Legends divisions anymore. And a similar story is true for Europe. Fnatic and SK are still around, and Evil Genius is kind of, they went to North America, but the rest of these organizations I don't think really exist. I think that's actually a really big problem in League Esports. You know, I'm a huge traditional sports fan, and when I root for a team, I do so because I know that they will always exist. The New York Mets will always be around for the rest of my life to disappoint me. Back then, League of Legends did have promotion relegation, which explains some of this, but that's still really sad to see all these teams disappear. I mean, if Schalke gets relegated from the Bundesliga, they still get to exist. You don't have the organization completely shut down. TSM has yet to win a game versus a Korean team. That brings me back. I think that was one of the first documentaries I ever made on my channel. Competitive League of Legends is yet to be broadcast on television. That is a really interesting sentence. That sentence might be the most interesting thing in either of these posts. You know, back in the early days of League, we had just seen the scene take a huge step towards professionalism. Korea had just had their OGN Champions League, the first professionalized MOBA league in the world, which saw all sorts of excitement and success. And we were now adopting that system to set up the LCS in North America, the EU LCS in Europe, as well as China and Taiwan. And there was a lot of optimism that this would eventually lead to a massive sports league that could be broadcast on television the same as any other sport. But as time went on, people started to realize that, okay, TV is kind of a dying medium. Maybe we shouldn't be tripping over ourselves to try to get League of Legends on ESPN. It kind of made a lot of sense for a more futuristic thing like competitive video games to not move backwards into an antiquated medium like broadcast television. But we are also now seeing how that has caused so many problems in esports. You know, a major reason why traditional sports bring in the massive revenues that they do is because of the TV rights deals that they sell. The NFL makes the majority of its revenue through selling its collective broadcasting rights, which is true for almost every big professional sports league in the world. I haven't really been able to keep up with it, but currently college football, not even the most successful or popular version of football in North America, is going through a massive wave of conference realignment because teams are leaving one conference to go to another because they can get a $50 million contract, $50 million a year, just to play 10 or 11 games of football over the course of a fall, which is insanity. There is so much money to be had in television, and because esports was never able to break that barrier, there is a chronic issue with profitability and bringing in revenue in the world of competitive gaming, which is sad. Oh, speaking of sad, Twitch TV LCS coverage regularly receives between 100,000 and 150,000 concurrent viewers. Oh boy, I think that is smaller today. The last I checked, I think LCS in North America had an average of 70,000 viewers for concurrent viewers or something. Like, oh, that is not good. The time capsule then ends with some miscellaneous notes. Uh, Teemo is still in the game. Pingu is not released. Earth the Manatee is not released. These are all memes that were going on in the community at the time. The CLG documentary is still not out, which is interesting. So back in season two, CLG commissioned an independent filmmaker to create a documentary on their team when they went to play in OGN Champions in Korea. And then the documentary had a weird production cycle to get to release. CLG kind of crowdfunded it with their fans, but then they partnered with Machinima for distribution, and Machinima kind of turned it into this uh, TSM Game Cribs drama reality series that nobody really liked. A lot of people complained about that, myself included, and then eventually CLG released an unfinished version of the original independent filmmakers cut of the documentary, which was unbelievably good. People absolutely loved the inside look and the interviews, and I mean, it, it was a work of art. It was great. I, I, it was unfinished, but I would still say it was better than any documentary I've ever made. There's a couple more notes. League of Legends is not 
yet an Olympic sport, which is interesting because it kind of almost is now. It is a part of the Asian Games this year, which includes gold medals, gold, silver, and bronze medals that are considered serious enough that if South Korea wins the Asian Games in League of Legends, then all of their players will be exempt from military service, the same way Olympic athletes are once they win a gold medal. And lastly, our League of Legends currently has 257,000 subscribers. Wow, that is a small, small community. That is, I have more subscribers on my YouTube channel than the League sub did back then. I guess that just goes to show how small and grassroots the community was at the time. It was a fun era. All right, let's go ahead and move on to the post, though, that predicted what 2023 would look like in the League of Legends community. Hello, Summoners. Today's date is February 17th, 2023. Welcome to our League of Legends. For starters, one of the most interesting things, I think, is how many subscribers this guy thought the League subreddit would have. Again, back then, it was 250k. I think this number was mostly a joke, but he said that the League subreddit would have about 5 million Summoners which we have more than that. It's like 6.5 million right now. <laughs> Just above that, you can see the LCS is being streamed on both YouTube and ESPN. Way down in the sidebar, there is a great little joke. So in the related subreddits tab, you can see there is an R Asian pro scene, American pro scene, African pro scene, European pro scene, Antarctic pro scene, petition for Australian server. Australia, always getting screwed over. This is mostly just a fun little joke, but I think it's actually kind of interesting in how it indicates the mindset of the League community at the time. You know, again, going back to OGN and the quickly professionalizing leagues all across the world, people kind of assumed that this was just gonna continue to spread, that everyone would fall in love with competitive League of Legends the way that Korea did, and it was only a matter of time before we had an Antarctic pro scene that, you know, the, the whole world did not embrace the game the way many thought. Now this predictive front post page actually took the form of two separate posts that we'll be going over in tandem. But if you just take a cursory glance at some of these headlines that this guy imagined might occur in 2023, one thing you'll notice is that there are a lot of pro players mentioned by name, Froggen, St. Vicious, Hotshot GG. Back in 2013, a lot of people followed the pro scene pretty religiously and the big name superstar players like Hotshot and St were these larger-than-life figures that you had a parasocial relationship with, the way you would a streamer or a YouTuber. It's kind of sad looking back at this and seeing the state of the game today. I mean, a lot of people do still follow the pro scene and people know the names of pro players all the time, but a lot of people don't feel like they have a super close connection with pros these days. I couldn't name every person playing in the LCS right now the way that I could back in 2013. I don't totally know why that is. I mean, maybe pros don't stream as much today as they used to, or they just don't have a close connection with the community in the same sort of way. Another thing you'll notice is that there are a lot of posts talking about teams being branded and sponsored by major corporations. There's Team Ikea, Team Dignitas Walmart, Team McDonald's, Google Gaming. Frankly, this was spot on in its prediction. We do have huge venture capitalists coming into esports and teams are owned by NBA organizations or billion dollar companies, but I don't think that's totally a good thing. Even though we did succeed in finding all sorts of institutional investment that has poured millions of dollars into esports, it has not exactly yielded the kind of growth or success I think a lot of people might have wanted. Players do get paid plenty of money, and, th and that is a really cool thing that pros are being paid to play this game professionally in a way that would be unimaginable back in 2013. But I don't know if the fan experience or if League in general is as fun as it was during like that grassroots era, or maybe that's just nostalgia glasses. Anyway, let's go ahead and go through a few of these posts headline by headline. Doublelift will announce his new team live on an ESPN special titled The Decision Lift tonight at 9 p.m. A joke about LeBron James, but I mean, Double Lift is still around. League of Legends, the movie cast announced. Robert Patterson as Ezreal, Jessica Alba as Sona, Jean I don't know how to say that, Ezra Necton, and more. There is no League of Legends movie yet, but League has totally broke into mainstream cinema with Arcane being a widely celebrated and critically acclaimed series that just won a bunch of Emmys. New attractions at Teemo Land Park, the Twitch, the Earth Ride, and the Spin to Win. This is funny, there is obviously not a League of Legends theme park right now, but there are like gaming theme parks like Nintendo Land that have been set up since this post was made. Wow, I can't believe pro players were so bad in 2013. Notice how he misses 
versus 2CS at 103 raffle. I love this post because it rings incredibly true. I was around back in the early seasons of League, so I hold a lot of these players in very high regard as trailblazers who set up the foundation for a lot of what the competitive scene was built on later, but if you go back and rewatch 2012 Worlds, a lot of newer fans of League don't really think that the gameplay is all that special. Riot, please, we have 941 champions now. I think six bans are not enough. So this is a joke that pokes fun at the fact that when League was released, it originally had 40 or 50 champions, and by 2013, that roster had grown to 112, but there were not added bans for the added new champions that a lot of people complained as being overpowered and complained they couldn't ban everyone that they wanted to. It was possible that Riot would never change the pick and ban system to include more bans, but we thankfully do have five bans per team now, as well as a whole new draft for the competitive scene. Today I learned 10 years ago there was a game mode called Dominion where you had to capture points to win. This is such a sad post. So as a reminder, this was made in 2013 when Dominion was still in the game. This guy was either joking that Dominion was so underplayed that people would forget that it even existed in the game, or he was predicting that League would eventually remove Dominion for being such a dead game mode, which tragically is exactly what happened. Man, old champions are fun. Check out my Lee Sin montage and Katarina Pentakill. So back in 2013, the champions that were considered over overtooled, who had these kits that had so many lines of text and abilities that they could never be balanced because these characters just brought so much to the table. They were champions like Lee Sin and Katarina. This post was joking that these characters would eventually be made irrelevant, maybe even considered boring with how many new characters must be eventually added to the game with even more overpowered kits. And that's exactly what we see today. The Phyrone Flats map, 5v5v5v5, is bugged at the moment. Blue and white Baron Nash spawn too soon. This is unbelievable. We actually have a 2v2v2v2 map in League of Legends now. Um, well, it's not 5v5v5v5, but that is a, that, that's a good call. Transfer rumors, double lift to Google Gaming for $7 million. This is another post that's kind of a joke about how it's an unrealistic, unimaginable number. Like, what if a pro would be paid $7 million to play League of Legends professionally? But we kind of hit it. I mean, there are million dollar contracts that are doled out to players nowadays. And lastly, David Turley, formerly known as the League Caster Freak, is running for Senate in Massachusetts. Unemployment does tons of damage to our economy. Freak did not go into politics, but he did go on to a better and brighter future from his casting career, now working at Riot as a game designer. You know, it's really kind of amazing how uh, this post was not far off from the reality that we see today. A lot of it was correct. We did grow League to a massive community that's even greater than the wildest expectations back then. And we did see the competitive scene explode into this massive institution that has unimaginable amounts of money poured into it. But I think there's a melancholic air that hangs over the future we did get to experience, especially when it comes to the esports stuff. Not all of the growth that we got to see was good. Even though there were plenty of companies and institutions and venture capitalists that poured money into esports, it didn't end up being a perfectly good thing. Looking at a lot of these posts, pros were larger than life in 2013. Everyone knew who Hotshot GG and St. Vicious and Ocelot and all of these people were. You had this grassroots community that cared so much about League of Legends, they were making fake front pages predicting this unimaginably great future in 10 years. Today, a lot of people feel apathy or anger towards League of Legends more than anything else, and a lot of people are pretty upset and frustrated at the way the esports scene seems to be contracting into some sort of scary winter that, I mean, the future is not nearly as bright. But to end this retrospective on a positive note, you know, even if League of Legends sees some sort of downturn, and even if the game ends up moving in a scary direction, I think the worst thing that could happen is we would contract to a point where we would get back to a smaller, more grassroots community just like this. That might not be quite as bad as it sounds.